direction which we wanted to to do this in a in a while ago uh, to present a more or less completed version of a scaling readiness report uh, Sudan first, and then uh, in maybe one or two weeks, we follow up with uh, with Morocco one, and then we follow up with another uh, thing with fine-tuned and updated modification of a report on synthesis. Uh, but that, that's that's why we are taking this in a stepwise. So here, uh, uh, Murat will present what is prepared so far in consultation with uh, as much as possible with Sudanese colleagues. I have also invited uh, National Technical Committee, uh, I, I forward this invitation. I don't know if they will be able to join. I have spoken to them this morning. They, they were having a National Technical Committee meeting today as an urgent matter to, uh, to speed up a few implementation activities in Sudan because it's been taking so long to put this uh, on paper, to confirm work plans, uh, budgeting and everything. Uh, so I hope they will be also joining, but I imagine, I think, uh, Murat, you mentioned that you will be recording this session. Maybe we can share this uh, with our NTC colleagues in Sudan, with all partners uh, in Sudan, so they can they can track uh, what is what is update on. Um, I think this is further... Uh, and you are hearing me? Okay. Yeah. So... If, yeah, I, I pass it back to you, Murat, uh, and then we catch up. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Talk to you. Thanks a lot, Akmal. And I see that uh, Alicia joined us as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Russia. Is there any problem from uh, Dr. Ahmad's side? Hey, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I think we're still waiting for Ahmed, our colleague here. Just give us mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining. As Akmal said, it's been a long while, and uh, I hope you are doing all well. We will uh, start actually going back to the course of what we agreed before, and uh, you know, in in two weeks periods, we will move on. We are starting with Sudan, and then uh, we will build up from there. So let's see. We are waiting for Dr. Akmal. But I think I can uh, quickly, you know, go to the next slide. And um, yeah, so it's been a while. So sorry to really keeping you waiting. And uh, but there is a reason, and I will try to explain it a bit later as well. You know, through the um, we had really ma major advances, and then uh, for a while there was a gap. And uh, that's mostly coming from my side. Apologies for the delay. I caused for um, for our work. As I said, we will try. I will try to catch up, and uh, we will um, quickly oh, come back Alicia? to the course. Connected now. And uh, yeah, I suggest we make a small round of introduction. Although we know each other, I see uh, can see Alicia for the first time, and Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, is also here. Hello, Dr. Ahmed. Can you hear us? Yes, hello. Hello. Can great. you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you well. And I think the yes. other colleagues as well. It's great to see you. So how are you doing? Good, good. <laughs> very busy, very busy, but uh, good. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, pretty much uh, exactly <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. You know, these days, I think IFAD is a really a very nice organizational landscape to be in. And the other organizations I'm working are all true reforms, <laughs> CGIR and GIZ and so on. So it really creates so quite good a to hear this impression about the fact. <laughs> yes, I think I mean you can tell, of course, better. But I think uh, you are the lucky ones these days. <laughs> <laughs> so we will go for a round of um, introduction. But uh, Alessandra, do you have any updates from Isabel? I think she was joining. Yeah, she's then... connected. I see her connected. Okay, excellent. And um, yeah. yeah, that's yep. excellent. So yes, it's and also Svetlana here as well. Yes, so. good afternoon, uh, Murat. Okay. I had some problem to connect to this app. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, apologies from my side. You know, this is a uh, sort of new app and uh, for um, in, like online collaboration. 
And you know me, I try to look for new toys all the time and bring it in, in our community, but they're very good reasons and I will try to explain later. But I think now we can go to short round of introduction. So Akmal made actually the welcoming. It could be great if we can introduce briefly ourselves, starting from, let's say, Isabel then. And then uh, we will move on. Isabel, can you briefly introduce yourself and refresh our yes. memories? Of course. So good afternoon. Uh, I don't know how to switch on, on the webcam, so sorry for this. Um, so my name is Isabel, and I am the regional analyst um, in the Near East, North Africa and Europe division. Uh, and I'm also uh, um, uh, managing this uh, grant, um, the scheme grant uh, with I ICARDA. Uh, very happy to um, to discover the results of the scaling readiness for Sudan. <laughs> Look forward to, the, to, to this. Thank you, Moat. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. If you want to open the camera, it's on the left bar. There is the butter sign, there is microphone and camera. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. okay, found it. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's great to see you. Yeah, Alessandra, uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, hi, welcome everyone. I'm Alessandra Garbero, lead regional economist in Near East North Africa division. Thanks, over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Russia, can you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, good, uh, good afternoon uh, and good morning to all. My name is uh, Rasha Omar. I'm the country director for uh, Sudan and Djibouti. And uh, similar to Isabel, looking forward to the results of the SKIM uh, work in uh, Sudan. Over. Dr. Ahmad, I think everybody knows you, but briefly, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name uh, is Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Subahi. I am the country program officer for Sudan. And uh, I have been part of this uh, initiative. I hope that uh, we can see something that uh, that can be appreciated by all of us. So Great. thank you thank so much. You. Thank you very much. Valerio. Good day, everyone. I'm Valerio Graziano, supporting the scheme project as knowledge management officer. And we have from uh, our team, Svetlana. I think she's Svetlana. Are you still here? I think she was uh, is around, but and also Alicia. This is the first time I see. Welcome, Alicia. I think can you briefly introduce yourself, please? Sure. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Alessia Marat, I'm a program officer for Sudan in Djibouti in the IFAD country office, and yeah, really looking forward to knowing more about the scheme initiative. Okay. Great, thanks a lot. So I think when Svetlana joins, she can introduce herself briefly. So now it's time for going to the presentation. Before going to presentation, I will actually briefly mention scaling readiness. Since we actually had the interaction uh, from scaling about scaling readiness, uh, you know, in uh, for the case of Moldova, there has been some changes. First, I would like to introduce briefly for the colleagues who has never seen before, and also introduce some of the updates. And then we will connect back to Sudan. And I think it's important to, we, I also wanted to present scaling readiness because the learning we create through complete studies for our IFAD cases directly feeds into C3A reform processes. So one of the good development that has been happening and partially why I am a bit uh, delayed as well, the C3A system is, a, as you know, it's an international research system. It's going on reform, and they were looking for new ways of um, understanding innovations. And we really showcased what we did together for the Moldova. And uh, now we're going to do the same for for Sudan. And uh, what we do together, in a nutshell, actually creates a bridge with the CGI in terms of learning about innovations. So what is scaling readiness for those colleagues who you know haven't uh, heard before? It is actually an attempt for integration, integrating research and innovation processes. That's an approach basically initially developed for CGIR to introduce an innovation perspective for development. In the development or in development investments, while doing our working on our solutions, we innovate a lot. And scaling readiness try to understand that innovative part of our programs and projects or interventions. 
it is indeed in, uh, coming from a previous history of um, readiness, which is NASA. Scaling readiness was inspired by NASA's early attempts to measure the innovations and try to understand how innovations advance as projects and programs evolve. One of the other things with the scaling readiness, which can be different, it aims to measure. So it aims to measure technical excellence of a solution and how it changes through time. And also try to measure the use of different solutions by combo combining the technical excellence by and the um, use of the solution. It tries to understand how much impact potential we can achieve with different innovative solutions. Here on the, you can you see different graphs. These are from livestock sector. They are very similar to our work in Sudan. Of course, Sudan is much broad, but it usually the scaling readiness given metric weave of how we are doing in terms of innovation performance. And then that is the news part to our colleagues as well. Since we last met, scaling readiness has moved on a little bit and it started to support especially innovation prioritization of larger uh, innovation attempts. You probably heard a lot of challenges and grand challenges on innovations and uh, startups. We started to support actually how we can measure all these thousand innovations potential to achieve impact in different countries and inform, let's say, FAO and CGIA so far, how they can prioritize all those innovations they uh, need to assess. There are basically six uh, cases that scaling readiness can help with. It's about project management. It's about portfolio management, informs about stakeholders, is prioritization, does evidence management and do innovation science. The, in our Sudan case, actually, we cover most of it. The full report gives uh, information about uh, portfolio, small portfolio of nature resource governance Sudan, provides some insights about which stakeholder can help, directly provides evidence on what has been done on nature resource governance, and indeed, in the future, if you have interest, produce science of other. And this is just one example where I want to show what we did before with Moldova, the profile here on the right C, actually will feed into Citria database. So what scaling readiness does, to having these complete studies, we really do a deep dive of innovations and their components. And this informs actually other projects who can possibly use it. So in, uh, in we already did for Moldova, and we will inform CGR what we are doing in Sudan. And here in the presentation, you see the different versions of sharing this information. It can be either done in the form of dashboards. This shows an example from um, Egypt and uh, basically most of the Swana region, how we can characterize innovations and show it in a dashboard for a different uh, program needs. And on the right side, you see different profiles, one pages or two pages documents to share the innovation information with our partners. So I will skip this one, but indeed we can use what we've done to have a deep dive on which projects, let's say the red dots, are working which innovations. You see all sort of hearts and uh, crosses, they show different types of innovations. The idea is here to understand all the projects, the red dots and their innovations and try to bring them together so that how, do we have a, to see the synergies across different projects if they are working on the same innovations, if they are working on the same innovations, how we can coordinate the action. So this is a bit, um, you know, scaling readiness. I wanted to give this to see the use prospects of our report. I will show the details, but if any of these users are interested, interesting for improving the impact performance of natural resource governance in Sudan, please let us know. We will try our best to not only support you, but also link you with the rest of the innovation world. Maybe there are some programs or projects already working in Sudan and doing similar efforts. And for now, so what we have is, uh, I'm skipping this here. 
that so far, as you know, we did already this uh, process in Morocco, sorry, Moldova. We had our first uh, scanning readiness full complete study on the left side. And then we wrote blogs together with IFAD colleagues. This is in the, in the presentation slide. You see it in the example from the UCIP. But we actually published the blog in also the ICARDA website. But as far as I know, a short version on IFAD internal web page. And our blog was also received, well received by the CGIA. And it's showcased indeed in one of the key products of CGIA in its news. And uh, while we were keeping silent, we also translated the report into Russian and Romanian. And then soon we'll share the copies, uh, the full design copies with our colleagues in Moldova and also with IFAT. And hopefully there are some hard copies. I don't know how we can best organize. I would like to ask also our IFAT colleagues how we can send the hard copies of these as well. So, sorry, it, it took a while for me to um, introduce or do the background, but now we are going to the Sudan case. But maybe I will have a small break here and ask if you have any clarification questions so far. You can just unmute yourself. I think we are a small team and we can um, go directly. Do you have any questions? Okay, so now then uh, the real content comes. We have Sudan case. So, so what we exactly? Okay, Alessandra, sure. So, so what about Sudan? So what we did, we the same as the other uh, complete study. We try to understand the nature natural resource governance framework and sustainable natural resource uh, and livelihood program in Sudan from innovation and scaling lands. So what we did, we did uh, we'd have initial interactions with IFAD colleagues and also some um, with the guidance of Dr. Ahmad, some um, stakeholders and colleagues from Sudan and try to understand actually when we say nature resource governance framework or the LILIT program, what do we mean? We, we, we managed to access to almost 50 resources, not all of them are Sudan, trying to highlight the innovative capacity and the performance of governance and the LIVELIT program. And then we did indeed and prepared a draft study. At the end of our presentation, we will share you the draft text and you will be, you know, we will be very happy to have your feedback. And here, initially, we had the feedback from, uh, significant feedback from uh, Gumar Kahlo. I think he was going to suggest uh, uh, participate, but I don't know what happened. And then of course, Dr. Subahi in, in Russia. But if you have any other comments, please let us know and we will make sure that the, um, your contributions are in integrated and also um, presented. So what we found out when we look at the governance program, the first thing or the overall thing we discovered was that it's an innovative framework. So although natural resource governance framework in the way that's been Sudan, done in Sudan has been implemented in other contexts and other countries, actually in Sudan, it has a lot of novel elements. And what we discover also while uh, the studying is that most of the natural resource governance program around the world focus on resource use, effectiveness and efficiency. But the new resource governance framework we also see so and a significant interest and focus and activities on inclusivity and sustainability. We found that actually by this inclusivity and sustainability and especially inclusivity elements, nature resource um, governance framework isn't quite innovative in uh, natural resource management for Sudan. We identify 23 different components that are critical for success, and 10 of these actually seems to be more novel. And we also found out that, you know, natural resource governance framework is not just only a programmatic structure, but it includes or combines different approaches, processes, 
platforms, digital systems, and teams. So in a nutshell, nature resource governance framework is actually a composite innovation with different uh, innovations of different nature. And on the right side, you see those 10. We thought that quite novel. And in the report, you will see quite a detailed articulation of what they are. But basically, when we are referring to natural resource governance in Sudan, we actually think about really a, a composite innovation, combining, let's say, a cluster or network approach, including a participation innovation approach. There are some platforms, drought and flood monitoring systems, and so on. So the first message we got from our study, nature resource governance framework is not just a simple policy or reference approach, but it has multiple elements that are quite innovative. And then this was the qualitative or overall um, conceptual analysis. And then we did the metric analysis by using two different axes. Basically, the vertical axis refer to documentation on technical excellence. What it does, for example, if we have subnational innovation platforms as a part of the NRGF, what is the documented performance of those platforms in Sudan? And that we found that is a number of six, and then we mapped it here. So the vertical shows the technical excellence based on docu documentation. Horizontal shows a classifier or qualified adoption. If we are actually at the level of 0, 1, 2, we are talking about our project partner or the intervention partner using the elements of natural resource governance framework. As we go towards 9, we start to see that the elements of natural resource governance framework are actually used by stakeholders who are not incentivized by the program or by the governance framework. So in a nutshell, our objective in this graph to increase the vertical as up as possible to show that we studied, we understood, we improved the technical excellence. And also to, to move the, the circles towards right to show that the users or the stakeholders who are actually using the nature or participating in nature resource government are not the only one that are being incentivized, but also the ones that participate and use it for their own benefit without incentivization. When we made the analysis, we found that actually, as you see, most of the circles cluster around the level. And basically the reason, and six refers to actually an application, or in this uh, nature resource governance framework, that has been to shown to work in similar countries, but currently, we don't know how it actually works in Sudan. When we did the systematic analysis, it was really challenging to find documents on the majority or holistic view on natural resource governance framework. Although we have support from Dr. Subahi and Goma, it, we couldn't really identify sufficient um, evidence. So what we found out in terms of readiness is that most of the components of the nature resource governance framework has been shown to work similar circumstances, but we are not sure yet for Sudan. Even though we might sure that documentation is not publicly accessible yet, that means that actually the learning we can create around them is limited. And similarly, when we look at the use levels, of different components, we basically these 10 things, flood monitoring system, investment framework, and so on. See, we found that actually the, they are mostly clustered on use level three. And what this use level three means, actually, we started to see different stakeholders becoming a part of the program, but almost all of them are incentivized by the program itself. We couldn't get the documentation that actually components of nature resource governance framework and its previous implementation by adapted without really incentivization structures. So in a nutshell, when we do the metric analysis, we realize that the current configuration of nature resource governance framework has been shown to work in other contexts, but we don't know how it is in Sudan yet 
or at least it's not documented, of course, I, I'm sure that our partners in IFAD knows it, but it's not publicly visible yet. And also the users we, uh, we can access or document for now are part of our intervention. Murat, can I ask a question just for sure. clarification? Please go ahead, Alessandra. So basically, so you evaluate this as a potential innovation for Sudan, right? Is it exact potential? This is an innovation in Sudan already, but it's potential for impact at scale. Okay, the, which means that the application is limited or or it means that like in application we have documentation from the for the components that actually they work but we don't have studies and also analysis showing that in sudanese context where we implement it has been shown to work and contribute to impact so if currently for example most of them are six it means they are designed well they've been programmed well but their performance we haven't documented yet so if you see that they actually those components for example the monitoring system contributes to policy action or intervention action. And we see that that benefits different stakeholders. We will start to see from six to nine. Is it clear? Great. And then similarly, like use level, we have three. That means that we have documentation of only the stakeholders whom we incentivize to use this governance framework. But we don't have documentation for the other partners who are not incentivized other stakeholders who are not incentivized for us. So as we see natural resource governance framework adopted by, let's say, private sector agencies who do not have funding from us, we will see that it's moving from three to nine. So this was the quantitative findings we could do. And then when we also look at the circles, you see that one of them is on the left. And of course, although they are already, all of them are at the same, vertical, which means technical excellence is documented excellence similar, is not being utilized or used much. And when we look at that component, it's, it's, it was actually a mechanism for co-prioritization of investment option. When we look at the natural resource governance framework, we realize that most of the components actually program into well and there are design and, um, you know, some applications already. But in terms of how we co-prioritize natural resource investments, we couldn't find any reference. We see that in other countries, in, in the similar approaches to natural resource governance framework, which is more inclusive, there's also an element for co-prioritization of innovations, which means if we're gonna support, which kind of activities we will support. In making that decision, how much of our stakeholders from different sectors or communities can influence. For that, we couldn't find any documentation. So the results of the analysis show that, you know, like if you want to really improve the current potential of the natural resource, growth, natural resource governance framework, we need to identify a mechanism for including the other stakeholders and communities in deciding the investments and prioritization of those investments. This was the one of the results coming, but as I said before, most of the documentation around very similar, except the the lack of use or lack of the clear use of the co-prioritization by stakeholders, we couldn't find any divergence. So this was about the natural resource governance framework. It's but it was actually a policy framework and also programmed, but we have also a big nature resource. Uh, governance and uh, livelihoods program. So initially, when we had interactions with the Sudan team and also then the stakeholders, we realized that actually the SNRLP in Sudan has the elements of energy fee, but advances it and adds up some other organizational and institutional innovations. So what we saw was that the program itself introduces some innovations. And when we do the deep dive analysis, we did that there is six different things. And uh, one of them is a strategy, two of them a plan. You see on the, the full list on the right side, we saw that actually when we talk about SNLRP from an innovation perspective, 
we not only refer to energy fee, but more. And you can see some of those differences. We see that actually SNLRP really makes quite a big advance, capitalizing the learning, of course, from the energy fee, but as more novel elements. And what we realize is when, when we look at the nature of those new elements, we saw that actually SNLRP connects the governance framework to broader sectoral and social cultural systems. So it's not about the policy and programmatic structure now, it's about other sectors, but it's also about communities and the social systems and cultural systems are communities embedded. And of course, one of the findings we did is, well, now the SNLRP scope is much more complex. And because it actually goes broader, it probably needs significant amount of engagement from non-governmental actors and representative of community engagement, community engaging supports. So we realize is that, you know, when we think about SNLRP, we should go a little bit beyond the scope of energy fee and start thinking about behaviors, community dynamics, and social systems. And we try to do the metric analysis on this time to the SNLRP. Sorry for the uh, typo here, but we got a similar picture. Most of the elements we saw actually, when we look at the evidence, how they work, is very similar to energy fee. Again, we saw that uh, similar to the other one, the energy fee, the multi-stakeholder investment prioritization element was invisible. But interestingly, we saw that most of the documentation was around actually conflict management options or conflict management practices. Interestingly, or maybe not that interestingly, we have much better documentation and much broader use of conflict resolution mechanisms in Sudan currently. But rather than that, the the pictures are very, quite similar. Of course, one reason that they share components, but the other reason was that we will come back. In terms of documentation, we don't have much progress or we couldn't access much of the documentation on um, Sudan natural governance and uh, livelihood nexus. And one of the things actually we would like to thank or maybe to maybe to also highlight is that most of the documentation we can access in natural resource governance framework was coming from IFAD. This shows that first, it's really you know great that there is significant documentation and preparation by IFAD, but it also shows a possible gap that we might need to encourage the other stakeholders, we will come back later, to study to work on and to provide evidence and insights about the components of nature, uh, sustainable natural resource program. And then what was the first step we identify similarly? It's, we need to really think about how we can design or incorporate an investment prioritization, a collaborative invest, investment prioritization option for Sudan and even since it's actually a core component, not only for the, the nature resource framework, but also the livelihood framework, it might indeed be better to formally institutionalize that investment prioritization and create a uh, space, continuous space, for the actors from civil society and private sector and the communities to have more say on investment prioritization and in the later stages for themselves to contribute to their efforts of the government and IFAD to improve the natural resource government in Sudan. So in a nutshell, what did the complete study find and recommends? The, there are a lot of things in the report you will see. Synthesizing was not that easy, but what we saw, three major things. The first, it is really critical to document the process dimensions of the nature resource governance framework and the program because both of them are actually have a, a quite innovative organizational and institutional arrangements and for organization and institutional arrangements since they touch upon the society processes are very important and what we recommend is really establish document and uh, establish some mechanisms to process not only the output and outcomes 
but only the or but also the processes so that we create learning how the natural resource governance is been working and hopefully by then the national and international academy will have a better say and you know contribute to the policy making around natural governance so the first thing we identify was that we need to document processes better and open it up for maybe the broader scientific and knowledge community and the second thing we recommend was that establishing a systematic knowledge management architecture which we in, we've been doing actually with partial contributions from skim is very relevant and we should as also the ifat evaluation report sir we should find mechanism to incentivizing partnership between sudanese government local universities research units and us international community to do knowledge management in a more systematic way because we've been in the ifat and national government have been innovating quite a bit of organizational arrangements and we need actually have a knowledge management architecture that can support the learning and enhances actually the impact of the programs and finally as i had before the co-prioritization investment is very important because sustainable natural resource and livelihood program cut across different sectors touch upon the communities it really creates um it engages private sector so it's very important to already think about an institutional system how how they can contribute in identifying where to put the money to be very quickly so that at later stages they can also invest currently we know the conditions in sudan of course government and international partners needed led by ifat will we play a significant role but we should already start thinking how we can encourage private sector and communities to be an active part of investment decisions and even support investment by themselves so this is all from my side i hope it wasn't too much and there is more details in the in the report and we will share it shortly but we try to actually share let's say the highlights of the report so over to you for the questions if you would like to go a little bit um, use the tool on the left side before microphone wide video share you will see a react there you can uh, respond you can use different uh, icons that I've been using for the different questions or if you have any comment question idea you can use the option on the left side and um, let us know you have a comment question or an idea this is the Q part that you will see but if you want to also talk it's it, please go ahead because we are a small group so over to you for questions and comments and feedbacks So maybe um, maybe just a question of uh, clarification also to Russia and the colleagues on the criteria for selecting this innovation, right? Because of course, if um, an innovation you're evaluating the potential and in, of an innovation, it won't materialize on the ground, right? You don't have any evidence, you don't have documents, so it's mm -hmm. a bit of a, so. I guess if you want that, you need to evaluate past innovations for projects that are closed. So my understanding is that SN LLP, I cannot pronounce it, it's a new project, right? And, um, and so basically, uh, maybe question to Russia and the team uh, to elaborate a bit, uh, um, a bit, a bit on this, and then I have other questions so that I can maybe see whether my questions are appropriate or not. <laughs> Okay. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Alessandra. And I would suggest also Ahmed can um, expand. Um, now, we selected um, the natural resource uh, governance framework because this was a framework that was developed uh, during the Bhutana Integrated Rural Development Project. And <clears throat> is uh, also you know it is uh, referred to in our country strategy <coughs> for uh, for policy engagement and it's also being replicated in the uh, sustainable natural resources and livelihoods program <coughs> 
and aspects of it were also replicated in the livestock marketing and resilience uh, program. So that's why we wanted uh, a more complete documentation, if you want, of this particular um, uh, framework, uh, because we were going to use it um, for the implementation of SNRLP going forward, but also for uh, policy engagement. And I'll hand over to Ahmed if he has additional comments. Yes, uh, <coughs> Russia. <coughs> and uh, let me start by saying, but really, I am impressed with this uh, uh, very good analysis for what we have already provided for this uh, scaling up uh, readiness. And as Russia mentioned, Alessandra, uh, and by the way, all the findings, they are quite logic with the, with the search of the development of this, uh, of this framework because it is uh, early started in the bed the Bhutan integrated rural development uh, project and this is the first time such kind of process to be started in 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 sudan and i can say this is one of the innovations that can be recorded for ifad interventions in, in sudan and uh, with uh, Bhutana uh, project then we think about uh, just if there is any possibility or potentiality to replicate this uh, process and approach uh, uh, in other projects. And as Russia uh, is, uh, already mentioned that we tried to replicate this in the LMRP, the Livestock Marketing and Resilience Program. And now what uh, the recommendations and the findings of this, uh, of this analysis it can be very good for strengthening the, the, the process by uh, it is upscaling within the SNRP project. All the points that mentioned with, uh, with regard to the lack of evidences and, and sufficient documentation and engagement of other stakeholders like private sector and, 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 and others, this is really uh, comes at the right time for real uh, upscaling for this uh, intervention and process in, in, in Sudan. So I think all the findings, they are quite logic for the search of uh, the development of this approach and, and process. Over to you. Thank you very much. Before giving the floor to Alessandra, really also, you know, Alessandra, when you look at the, the program documentation, you really see the historical build up. So I was quite pleasantly surprised and actually quite intrigued how the learnings from different, different IFAD projects on the terra and so on was integrated into the livelihood program. So in a nutshell, you know, those components, some of them were early experimentation from the nature of resource governance framework work project. And then there were some work like components coming from the markets. That's why the livestock markets and we have the private sector. But in the program, they've been actually fed into a single system. But to complement what has been documented by the, you know, the program proposal, we also looked at the other natural resource governance uh, in different like surrounding countries in the region. We looked at Egypt, we looked at Ethiopia, you know, for the livestock sector, a little bit even, uh, you know, the towards even Uganda to see actually how different implementation of natural resource governance is made. That's where we also started to see the critical role of early inclusion of private sector and other civil society organizations, not only users or receivers of, let's say, investment, but also thinkers and possibly and hopefully sooner investors on the nature resource governance. Over to you, Alessandra. No, maybe if you allow me, uh, Dr. Murad, before Alessandra can step in, just to, to emphasize on a point that you have already mentioned with regard to the, uh, the transitional search in Sudan. As you are, you are quite know, Sudan now is passing through a, a transitional period where there is no stable government. Everything is on transitional in terms of the structure, systems, regulations, uh, whatever that related to the government. So uh, this is a transitional period. You cannot expect a, a very committed regime and well-established uh, and stable regime to take over these issues uh, properly. Over. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Alessandra. Thanks. No, thanks so much. I don't want to monopolize the conversation as also Isabella has questions, but maybe because I need to leave and I wanted to offer a few comments, right? Because I know the instability of Sudan and the context matter for stakeholders engagement, right? But uh, also this, we've been discussing also with Russia and other country director on this is an innovation for policy engagement, correct, Russia? So basically um, what uh, I think the conclusion are very interesting also in light of the stock tick, but we will have, we will have next week. Yeah, but when so. they, yeah, when we talk about systematic knowledge management is that monitoring policy processes is remarkably difficult and even more difficult in, in fragile situations, right? With political instability. So when we, when we say document processes, can we be more specific and uh, establish granular indicators, granular policy indicators for which we can that we can track then to evaluate whether uh, evaluate the system, right? Because you say this is an approach that has different, um, I mean, has different components. You know, if this, if understood correctly, an ecosystem-based cluster approach, multi-stakeholder investment options, intra-state mm -hmm. collaboration platforms, and so forth, right? So all of this have different stakeholders, and so maybe you need to set up. A qualitative strategy structure, right, with interviews to see whether these different elements are performing, and uh, and maybe and then score them into a policy indicator that then we can report at the end of a project to say, I mean, I would say, okay, this has worked, this has that has not worked. So I think it's more setting up the right M and E system for mm -hmm. uh, policy indicators. I think yeah. uh, which basically involve also. Visit, evaluating the, the partnership with the stakeholders mm -hmm. and the risk that, of this partnership over, sorry. Ex exactly. So actually that's why we said systematic knowledge management architecture, but we didn't go one step beyond because to understand what kind of, you know, the toolkit would fit the Sudan currently is a bit challenging. And we need really the leadership of, you know, Russia, Dr. Ahmed, and the, also the other colleagues, what could be the tools that can fit for purpose. What we can do, bring in IFAD's learning, because it has, IFAD is a global organization and working with different contexts. And there's a, actually also your, you know, the Athena, I still remember, there's a lot of tools and things developed there that can fit. But also from, also from our C3AR side, you know, C3AR usually tries to aim for the top-notch innovations. And then there are a few ideas that can come there. For example, for the livestock, there's a lot of now satellites imagery and so on to see what's going on, creating market models from using satellites, seeing the pathways of animals and how they can be actually, you know, the where can be the safest markets. Or in terms of processes, you know, sometimes uh, the different analog phones capture some data and by actually seeing who is where and how they come together through the cellular phones, we started to see the collaboration patterns. So in a nutshell, the clear answer to that can only be given by the leadership of the colleagues in uh, Sudan, because they are the ones that know. But I think from the IFAD side, there's already quite a few tools that might be relevant. We can also from C3R side give a few ideas, but the exact form is a, to find out is, as you said, Alessandra, we need to actually discuss and come together to find out what works best. I hope that's an answer. No, uh, thanks so much. Isabel, sorry keeping you waiting, but the conversation no, was no, very no. nice. Yeah, no, of course. No, no, uh, no indeed. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, I agree with what um, Alessandra said. Um, I was also thinking, yes, that it's very uh, interesting. Um, um, to look at it from the angle of the policy engagement and to see uh, what how the knowledge management um, is supporting this uh, this process. So, in the case of the uh, NRGF, I think it's quite a, a recent achievement. No, in Sudan, I don't remember. Ahmed can tell us when it was um, exactly uh, this uh, framework was established. So, uh, but still, I think it would be interesting also to understand um, the contribution of the of the other projects in this process, um, and um, what um, SNLRP, of course, is going to capitalize on on what uh, what has been done uh, before. 
Um, you have mentioned that you have looked at um, other uh, similar uh, framework for natural resource management in other countries. And I think it would be also useful to have more details uh, to compare you now what, um, uh, what is the level of achievement uh, in these countries uh, compared to Sudan. And maybe it would be helpful to understand what needs to be done you now to bring it to the, to the next level. Uh, you said, the, yeah, you mentioned the role of the, the other stakeholders engaging private sector actors also. Uh, I think it's very relevant because we had a discussion yesterday with uh, Russia and the team for the other project for IMDP and uh, we have noticed that there are still difficulties in uh, uh, making progress in this, uh, in this area. So I think this is really something uh, we need to understand better how this uh, platform, multi-stakeholder platform can be um, adapted now to the Sudan context. So mm -hmm. um, we stop there, but um, there, yeah. I think you know there, there. Of course, there are many options, but some of the options that comes to on top of my mind, for example, community community-based breeding programs in Ethiopia are very successful. Yeah, and I don't know if you have experience on that. And one of the reasons was that you know, like initially, the idea is that we will have a breeding program, well designed, driven by the science and research, but access to rural Ethiopia was difficult and some of the you know challenges that Sudan experiences was replicated there so you know the government and the other partners come up with a more decentralized breeding program and try to incre increase the ownership of the local stakeholders in some of the rural areas actually it works so the now although it's efficiency let's say is less than and the government led and big breeding program is working quite well because with the lesser ambitions but it's locally owned the second one was a this is also from ethiopia study in the vaccination for example they tried to experiment how they can improve the vaccination in uh, different regions and they started to experiment with the different stakeholders if they can take a lead in vaccination one focused on the youth rural youth can they be they become you know some kind of veterinary servicing the villages and some others actually were trying to, you know, focus on women, a bit of experimenting. The results are a bit com like, you know, um, not necessarily that clear. But what is was that like, like there are some examples of community led livestock programs, especially I'm more aware that can be informing what we can do in Sudan. But also the other thing is that it was very interesting. Livestock is an asset for everyone in the region. It has multiple intersections with social cultural systems, but it's an asset. So everybody tries to protect them by using this local community members can be incentivized to lead investments. And there are a few, you know, like models there too. I know one very well from Ghana is a bit far away, but in a nutshell, you know, like uh, we looked at different options and tried to mention them. But if we have a like, clear question in a sector, I think it's easier for us to contribute with some of the ideas and develop models that can inform colleagues in Sudan. Yeah, I think that would be great. Maybe Russia um, and the team can come up with uh, clear questions on, no, for, for you to, to focus. Yeah. What do you think, uh, Russia and Ahmed? I'll give the floor to Ahmed uh, Isabel, yeah, sure. if he has any thoughts. Yes, uh, Isabel, thank you so much. Uh, and, and I would like just to emphasize on the fact that uh, the Butana Integrated Rural Development Project, it was completed in 2019. And it has a fairest component. It has a fairest component that uh, relates to policy and institutional uh, uh, improvement. So the, the development of this natural resources uh, governance framework, it, it came under this, uh, under this component. And really speaking, or frankly speaking, the, the, the project didn't manage to make a breakthrough only in the last two years. 
before completion. And as you know, this process is, is a lengthy process that starts with the uh, conferences at the community level, then these conferences go up to the locality and to the state, and finally to the national uh, uh, level. Uh, it was a time-consuming process. And uh, fortunately, after some delays, we managed to get this brilliant uh, consultant, Dr. Juma, who, who managed to, to, to lead this process up to the stage that now we, we, we can uh, see the outcome of it. And for sure, the issues of the policy indicators and the, 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 the proper uh, engagement of the m and &E just to, to find out the, 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 the real indicators for the achievements on the policy issues, this is something that we need to consider. And I can see the recommendations already uh, Dr. Murat highlighted in, in this presentation, they are really quite useful for us. Uh, if we can take from here onward, we can improve uh, our uh, activities within this, uh, within this uh, framework, even through the, 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 the SNRP uh, project and onward. And even we can take uh, the whole uh, thinking on how we can uh, try to maximize our use uh, uh, from the knowledge management uh, products. And as, as you know, we are just relying on the knowledge management products just to, to, to show evidences and to influence the policy makers to take the right uh, actions and decisions with regard to policy reform. So I believe this uh, study it, it came at the right time that we can pick uh, all the findings in this uh, uh, in this study so as to improve our uh, future performance with regard to the policy engagement uh, issues. So thank you so much for Dr. Murad for this uh, very useful analysis for our, our case. Over. Okay. Isabel, would you like to continue? Otherwise, I will ask Nadia. Oh, no. Thank you. No, 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 no. I really uh, appreciate what uh, Ahmed has said uh, now. I think um, we should um, try to, yeah, to take stock of this uh, analysis and uh, apply it for SNLRP, you know, on the on the KM uh, on the KM aspect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Noted. Uh, Nader, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, we can hear. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, uh, I want to thank Mr. Murat actually for this informative presentation. Although I came a little bit late, late. I am uh, Dr. Nadir Yusuf Hamdan, uh, Livestock Marketing and Resilience Program. It is a fat funded project. And actually, now we are, although we are uh, in the completion state, stage, the project is actually be closed on uh, coming September. But now it is in the completion state, and actually we are having some uh, uh, natural resources projects actually uh, to be uh, enhanced during this period of uh, extension. Actually, uh, fortunately, we granted IFAT has granted uh, a period of six months extension for uh, livestock, and mainly will be implemented through uh, natural resources uh, projects, actually uh, funded by GEF. Uh, and it is a good, a, a good actually opportunity for us actually to go through this uh, natural resources government framework. Actually, we can you see uh, get uh, this chance and try even you see to enhance. You see, for during this uh, coming four months, I see to enhance our projects actually dealing to the to the recommendations actually uh, come from uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, also, I, I don't know, because I hear uh, Isabel uh, Suarez, Suarez is here. I don't know whether she is. Isabel, she worked with, with, with World Bank before or in, in Khartoum, because if she is, actually she was actually one of my reference, re, re, references in, uh, in my uh, series. Uh, <laughs> thank you a lot, actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you a lot and uh, 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 over. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've never worked for the World Bank, but uh, I'm very happy if I can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. But I've been working uh, on the Sudan program for a long time um, with Russia when she was first the CD. Um, and uh, now I'm the regional analyst uh, in then. I see. So it's like a spillover impact, Isabel. <laughs> Positive impact. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Documentation. Yeah. It's great. Is there any questions uh, of clarification or any other comments? Uh, if not, we can go for actually the next steps or the way forward. But let's see actually if we have any other questions, clarifications. Okay, for the for the way forward, like uh, we will share, the, of course, the presentation slides. And also the recording for some of those colleagues who had the challenges and joined late with the with you. And then also we will share the draft. We already have 80 percent, let's say, completed design. I think the designed version will be better to read for you. So it will be coming in a, in a week or so. And then we are really encouraging you to contribute as much as you can. The critical part is really the executive summary for most of us, but for other colleagues who want to go deep dive, they are always welcome and will be happy to have the contributions. And I don't know, Isabel, if you would like to make a few uh, you know, comments or how do you see we can continue. And also if Akmal, I think he's still having challenges with his microphone, but if he can come back. Yeah, we can give the floor to Akmal, yeah, it's a pleasure. Akmal, can you hear us? I think he has the issue with the phone is trying to set it up. Yeah. Okay. For now, uh, you can you can go ahead and I will also ask Russia and other colleagues how they see the way forward. They already signal actually with what's possible. But yeah. it could be have a round of uh, feedbacks. So over to you, Isabel. For yeah, no, thank you. Uh, um, thank you. Well, I think yeah, it would have been good to hear from uh, Russia and the team uh, how they would like to take um, this recommendation forward. And um, um, for the yeah, if you are going to share the uh, the full report, maybe we can um, add a little bit of, of details on the NRGF process. I think it would be useful not to understand. Um, mm -hmm. As um, Ahmed has explained, it, it, it has been a long process, and maybe we can explain how the Butana project has contributed to this um, to this achievement, and uh, what what is uh, going on now uh, in SNRP. Um, what else can we? And um, then I don't know if we are planning to have uh, other meetings to present uh, this finding um, to Sudan. I don't know if the, the Russia finds that there is some um, interest maybe to uh, discuss with uh, other stakeholders in Sudan. Yeah, I think I will, I will leave the floor to, to, to Russia. Thank you. Thank you, um, Isabel. So, um, um, you know, on the natural resource work in particular, uh, LMRP has um, and Dr. Nader's team have um, are you know have done two major or three major uh, works. The first one was the um, inclusion of climate change adaptation within the natural resource management strategy of Sudan. The second is that uh, they have also listed all the policy issues related to natural resources by uh, state and developed a roadmap uh, by state and at federal level to address them. And uh, the third uh, document that they are currently preparing with the Range and Pasture Administration is to uh, develop a, na a natural, um, what they call range and pastures uh, policy paper. 
So all these uh, three documents are uh, building on the experience of the uh, Livestock Marketing and Resilience Program, as well as what you've mentioned, uh, Isabel, the earlier projects. Um, you know, this uh, whole uh, aspect has been initially developed with South Cordofan, uh, which uh, started, you know, uh, this whole work uh, addressing the stock routes uh, that were crossing the Habila semi-mechanized areas and developing conflict resolution uh, for the pastoralists and the settled farmers and the semi-mechanized farmers around there. And then it uh, continued uh, from there in the successive projects. So um, we'll uh, use the, I have, you know, I really need to read the, the document to understand the, the content and uh, how it can be used. Uh, our main issue is enforcement of the existing policies. And uh, this whole facilitation process is really to, to basically promote awareness about the policy measures, as well as um, uh, address enforcement of local legislation, as well as the federal and state legislations. And then finally, you know, to be able to better regulate the movement of the, of the livestock so that they do not degrade either water or rangeland resources. Uh, and uh, similarly, basically to contain the, the horizontal spreading of uh, farming. So that's a bit of the driving force behind the natural resource governance framework. Um, so I have to see what the document has to say, and then we can, uh, you know, uh, we'll probably be synthesizing based on all the other uh, work that LMRP and SNRLP are already doing. Over. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's like the synthesis, I think, really important and the key word here. And uh, we can also try to see how we can contribute to the existing efforts and what are, if there's any gaps. So what I was going to say, Russia, if you feel any gaps in innovations and, you know, models and so on, it could be great if you can inform us. We can quickly see what kind of learning we can, you know, chip in from the, let's say, the C3R system. And also, of course, the IFAD colleagues at the center. Because there is the Natural Resource Management Committee, if I'm not mistaken, right, Isabel? There can be also some learning coming from them as well. Yeah, Murad, if you can allow me to stay yeah. in at this yeah. stage, particularly whenever I hear the learning, then I, 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 I need to, to respond to this work. You remember, Dr. Murad, I started to communicate with you last year on provision of some uh, technicalities and capacities to our knowledge management core, uh, core team here in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And it is quite obvious that there is a, a big gap in, in, in just having a systemic way in dealing with the knowledge management and then the policy issues uh, with regard to the uh, uh, the, the right approach uh, just to handle the, uh, such uh, very important uh, issues. So I, I think with the presence and participation of Isabel, it will be a good opportunity that I can just raise this request for a provision of a, a training program for our knowledge uh, core team here in Sudan. Uh, from the perspectives of these indicators, how they can develop indicators on the policy engagement issues, as well as uh, the knowledge management uh, products uh, in general. So I hope it will be the right time to, to, to just uh, raise this issue once again. Thank you. Yeah. I was thinking maybe um, this is a good opportunity maybe to document the uh, NRGF process, no? to have maybe a, a KM uh, not on this. Uh... Isabel, the process is documented. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Goma had documented it. Okay. Uh, it's probably, uh, I, we need to check if the documentation is in Arabic. If it's in mm -hmm. Arabic, we can get it translated. Yeah, if we can get this translation, yeah. That would be a good occasion that mm -hmm. when we release this, um, the, the report, maybe we can also uh, disseminate. No, Russia, it is, uh, huh? Russia, it is in English. 
Ah, it's in English. Okay, very good. Mm. Okay, excellent. So yeah. we can translate it into Arabic then for wider mm. audience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And even if you like, uh, if you don't have it, uh, Isabel, I will share the document with you. Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, yeah thanks, yeah. Ahmed. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are working on this um, on the policy process for the stock tech, so yeah. I'm also yeah uh, collecting all the documents and uh, planning to maybe when we have time to to write something. Uh, so yeah, that's very uh, useful. Yeah, I was going to actually <laughs> give you the floor, Valerio. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, all. Um, Nakamal is having some technical issue in conveying his message, so I'll be his voice uh, for what he sees as a, way, as a way forward on this. And he would uh, suggest that stakeholders uh, on ground might uh, find suitable to work on other innovations especially linking to the Sudan Knowledge Management Core Group uh, in close collaboration with the Scheme National Technical Committee. They can discuss the outputs of the scaling report and uh, advice back, of course. And um, Scheme will be happy to hear feedbacks, of course, on practical level, which were all of the points um, raised before also on uh, many concerns on uh, probing uh, the, actual, the actual efficacy on ground and maybe further documentation and data could be, uh, could be found uh, peering into these networks. Mm -hmm. Another point right now, he uh, apologizes, he would have uh, possibly contributed more uh, without sound, uh, was a little bit difficult and in order to help him in the efforts, uh, he's conveying additional points. Um, the experiences, uh, outputs of the implemented activity, projects and programs uh, could benefit from a boost in, in knowledge sharing. And also that is something that could be done as a way forward to try and give uh, more access uh, through these, uh, to this information that we are peering into through the scaling readiness action, and from this uh, bringing to the surface this knowledge, uh, it could be possible to analyze for uh, more lessons learned that could, of course, iterate the process of informing scaling readiness and further action. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I'm looking at actually our um, participant list and then uh, we have Omar. Can you hear us Omar? Do you have, do you have any feedbacks and comments? He wants to share the screen. I don't know if it's intentional or not. Is it, is it the microphone or maybe it's the... Omar, can you hear us? We cannot hear you, but let me try to unmute you. Omar, can you hear us? I think there's a problem there. And I see also maybe Omar can solve the problem. Alicia, do you have any feedbacks and comments? Can you hear me? Yes. No, 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 thanks. It, I think it's just been really interesting. And I think it will be even more interesting then to see how SNRFD can actually take up the recommendations. Um, and especially, I think the third one you had on multi stakeholders and involving different actors, I think would be quite critical in this sense. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking at the chat if uh, Omar. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much. I think it was uh, great to connect and discuss. It appears that we have some actions. And uh, as Valerio said, Akbal really wanted to be here, but uh, his travel plans has changed. So he, he he's sorry, but I'm sure we will have opportunities for Akmal to join and guide us. And then I would like to give floor maybe to for the closure, since Akmal is not here, to Isabel.
and you can delegate any person isabel for the closure over to you thank you thank you Murat. Uh, um, really sorry that uh, akmal uh, cannot join us but uh, i hope we can uh, have um, another discussion with him or so uh, next time uh, so thank you so much for uh, sharing the findings of the um, NRM uh, study for uh, Sudan. So I think we have uh, very interesting um, elements um, to, uh, that we can highlight now in the, when we publish the, the report. Um, on the way forward, uh, we can still um, uh, maybe uh, uh, further discuss with um, Russia and uh, Ahmed to see what would be the uh, the key uh, areas where they want to 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 focus. Maybe uh, coming with uh, maybe clear uh, issues that they have identified, uh, as Russia mentioned, for the livestock sector for the um, and um, uh, to document or so, yeah. Um, then um, I leave it to you to uh, let us know what is uh, the next step, um, when we can expect to receive so the full report and mm -hmm. um, provide feedback. Uh, maybe Alessandra, uh, she mentioned before leaving that she would uh, be happy to uh, further discuss. So uh, maybe the, let's schedule uh, another meeting when we once we have read the, the full report. Maybe mm -hmm. we can invite also uh, IFAD colleagues, which are uh, specialists in uh, NRM, uh, and maybe the PTL, the team leader, uh, technical. Um, uh, advisor for for Sudan if Russia feels that it can be um, useful so that these are my suggestions thank you thank you very much Russia for the last voice and uh, feedbacks and guidance yes I look forward to receiving the report and then we'll be liaising with um, Isabel and uh, the team about uh, next steps over Thank you very much. So, like, uh, we will talk to the designer. Like, I, I expect this uh, the full report draft is coming next week, unless there is a major issue. But we will uh, share the presentation, and maybe like for speeding up the process, executive summary as early as possible, and then we will share the full report next week. And from there on, also with the, I think Valeria took a note, we will organize a meeting with Akmal's present definitely to discuss the, some of the other issues, as you said, Isabel. So thank you very much, everyone. It was great to catch up with you and hopefully we will continue our journeys. It was great for me, as I said, going back to this, really apologies for the delay. I hope it was worth a little bit and looking forward to continue building up. Take care. Until thank you, goodbye. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Bye. Thank you, Rasha and Ahmed. Bye -bye. Thank yeah. you, colleagues from Sudan. <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye.